get into the point we are at uh, tonight to be able to, to move the process forward and engage with the community in the weeks to come as to what uh, kinds of middle schools we want in the city. Uh, we, as you'll see tonight, you'll hear a presentation from uh, our, our team of architects as well as our, our project manager. And everyone work, has worked really hard uh, on this. Uh, we have the local school building advisory committee that has been meeting weekly, uh, discussing the options, taking surveys, uh, and we've heard uh, throughout the past several years uh, the need and uh, desire to return to a middle school model in the city of Holyoke after years of having a K-8 model uh, in the district. And so what we're doing now is assessing uh, sites uh, in the community, and we're at one of those sites uh, now in the vacant uh, parcels of land uh, across the street on Chestnut Street uh, as one of the potential sites, uh, and then other areas throughout the city uh, as well. Um, I also want to thank the members of the school committee uh, who are here with us uh, tonight as well. We have uh, Ward 4 representative, Irene Feliciano Sims, uh, Ward 1, Mildred Lefebvre, uh, Ward 3, uh, Dennis Burks, uh, Ward 6, uh, Ronnie Collimore, and I think uh, that's it uh, for uh, school committee members. I just want to thank them for their service and commitment uh, as well, both on the school committee, but also uh, their work in advising the work around the, around the middle schools. Uh, one of the biggest uh, concerns we hear from parents and families around uh, the middle school opportunities in the district is that depending on what grade school you go to, depends on what type of educational facilities you may have access to uh, in, those, uh, in those buildings, whether it's arts and music or engineering and math, science laboratories. And one of our guiding principles moving forward, and we want to get input as to uh, what you would like to see in middle schools, is making sure that all middle school students have access to a high quality educational experience, but also the top notch facility uh, as well as in our community. And it's also important to note that the last time the city of Boya got a new school constructed was in 1989. Uh, so almost 30 years ago was the last time that uh, Holyoke was, was getting a, a school uh, newly constructed uh, here in the city. So I think it's long overdue that we get this investment. Uh, overall, it is a, an expensive proposition, but uh, what greater investment than to invest in making sure that all students get a great education uh, here in the city of Holyoke. And with the Mass School Building Authority, uh, this is an opportunity to get upwards uh, of 70 percent, up to 80 percent reimbursement on some of these projects. So uh, again, I want to thank everyone who's been involved up to this point. I particularly want to thank the community members, parents, uh, students uh, who are here tonight and who will engage with us uh, in the coming weeks and months, because uh, I think that's the most important part of this process uh, by investing so much time, energy, and resources. We want to make sure that the final outcome is something that the community and all of us uh, can be proud of. So thank you again for uh, being here tonight. I'm going to introduce uh, Dory, who represents the architectural firm that has been working with the city to move this project forward. Thank you. Well, so, um, welcome. Uh, we, I see all kinds of people here. I see teachers, parents, students, elected officials. So thank you for uh, being here tonight. Uh, I'm privileged to be here to kick off what I think is a really exciting journey for the school system to uh, to get a state of the art school building here, uh, which we haven't had in over 30 years in Holyoke. And um, you know, we're we're committed to developing a pathway to every, for every student. We want students to graduate our schools who are thinkers, who are communicators, who are proud of their community, um, who and who are leaving our schools with more than just a diploma. But a big part of that is what happens in schools. But having the quality facility to do that is really important as well. And uh, since I've arrived in Holyoke, I've heard loud and clear that um, we have we have issues with our heating and cooling systems. They don't exactly heat when they're supposed to. They don't cool when they're supposed to. Uh, we have issues with being able to see out of windows. Our, you know, the artificial daylight isn't, uh, our, our lighting isn't strong, our, um, both artificially and through windows. Um, our, the safety of our buildings as students enter the building and people enter the building, we don't have the state-of-the-art technology for that. So just on a pure facility level, the, having a building that's conducive to learning, to high quality outcomes for kids is really important. The second thing I'd say is, when I arrived here, you know, I've learned about in Holyoke, it's hard to get everybody, anybody to agree, everybody to agree on something. Getting consensus is near impossible, right? I learned that pretty quickly. But I have been shocked at how unanimous the support has been for middle schools. From the moment I arrived, from the, many of the school committee members who are here tonight, I heard it, I heard it from them, and I have to say I didn't believe it when I first heard it. But then as I talked to parents, and we talked to students, and we talked to teachers as well, to a person, 
they, they felt like the move to K-8 was a mistake for the city of Hope. And now that I've seen it, um, I believe that it's important for us to, uh, to think about um, standalone middle schools that serve a unique age for students. And in today's 21st century learning um, experiences, we, we need our students to be prepared. The buildings we have uh, don't necessarily prepare our kids. And also the way we staff them programmatically don't work. We have teachers who are teaching multiple grade levels, uh, who are teaching uh, multiple content areas. It's very hard to be an eighth grade teacher who teaches math and science to both seventh and eighth grade. In some cases, we have teachers teaching sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, and so there's nothing in the research that suggests that that is, is good for kids, and it's, it, it, makes it, it makes it difficult for um, our teachers uh, to, to attract quality teachers and to retain teachers because they're most come very invested in their subject area and want to remain there. Uh, we also need state-of-the-art facilities that prepare our students for all students, not just general education, but our EL students, our special education students, our students with mental health issues. We need a facility that prepares them for what's next. All Many of you know we've invested in a high school redesign where we're asking students to, tr uh, to choose academies that are centered around global studies, uh, technology, around performing arts, um, just to name a few. We need a middle school experience that prepares them for what they're gonna see in um, high school. So it begins here tonight, and one of our values as a district is to be innovative and bold. I, I, we want to be bold. This is not an opportunity to just build a cookie cutter school. This school has to, it's, this school is for today, but it's also for 50 years from now. And we need to start thinking about that. So I don't want people to think about uh, what a student of 2018, I can't remember what year it is, but 2018 needs, but what does a student of 2050, 2060 need to be successful? And it starts with the bold ideas here tonight. So I challenge you, I urge you to be part of this process. This is the first meeting of what will be many conversations. We, we were fortunate to hear from teachers today and staff. Uh, they, the, the architects and the designers have talked to other staff in the district. But this is our opportunity to hear from you, and we hope that you stay involved in the process along the way. I do want to thank the school committee members who have, who have been champions of this project from the moment I arrived, and who were really committed to bringing a new school to Holyoke, and were committed to wanting a middle school uh, for the children of this community. So thank you. I turn it over to Dory um, to take it from here. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, my name is Dory Brooks. I'm a project architect with Jones Visit Architects. Um, we've been selected to be the architects for this project. Um, we are thrilled to be able to be the architects for this project. It means a great deal to us uh, because we're a Western Massachusetts firm. Uh, and, and this is what we do. This is the heart and soul of our work is working on school design. Uh, and we are very well aware of uh, the energy and the history and the excitement in this community. Uh, and we look forward to making a school that's appropriate to your community. Uh, I want to start with a little bit of housekeeping to give you just a preview of what we're going to do tonight. Um, this is, uh, there's an agenda on your table. Um, we're going to talk through the process because really what this is about is just kicking off a process that's going to last uh, four years. Uh, it's a long process uh, and it involves a lot of thinking and study and talking as well as designing, sharing our designs with you. But it, it's ultimately your school, so it's really important for us to hear from members of the community as we do this process. So I want to talk a little bit about the process, the initial goals that we're currently uh, pursuing as part of the feasibility study, or the schedule for all of this. And then we'd like to take a moment to just hear from you a little bit, know who you are and, and what brings you out tonight. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the educational programming part of the process. What makes us unique as a project is that there aren't currently middle schools. Uh, it, the, the Pat Lawrence situation is the closest we have to a middle school in this district currently. Um, so really the district is having to rethink what middle schools should be. And that's a really interesting process. And this architectural project pushes along that process at the same time. So uh, that's an unusual situation for us to be in. 
uh, and then we're also going to explore some of the sites. Now, I say this as a kickoff because we don't have all the answers. Um, we really want to hear from you. Um, we have been working for about a month now, uh, meeting with uh, teachers in the district and learning about this, the district's needs for middle schools. Um, but it's really just the very beginning. So while we want to share what we've learned, we also really want to hear from you, and that's, that's a really important part of tonight. Uh, so feel free to uh, participate at the end with questions, as well as telling us a little about, about yourself along the way. So first off, just to tell you a little bit more about ourselves. Uh, Jones Hinton Architects is based in Greenfield, Massachusetts. It was founded by Marco Jones. Uh, and uh, my other partner at the firm is Christian Winsett. You'll be hearing from both of them. Um, we are a firm of 11 people in Greenfield, Massachusetts. And again, uh, this is a, a focus of what we do. All those blue dots represent uh, communities in which we have done a school project of some kind, say 20 schools over 30 years. Um, and on the right hand side is a picture of uh, Plains Elementary. That's a school we recently opened in 2016, We're not very far from here. So we have that to, to point to and say, you know, really, no, we know what we're doing. And we are excited to do what we do here in this community. Um, this is also uh, the team that's involved on this project. So a school project involves a number of consultants, uh, different engineers of different subsets, uh, security consultants, uh, interior design consultants. So while you'll see a lot of us, and me in particular, this is sort of a daily experience for me, um, there are a number of people behind us who are actually also working really hard to bring about this project. And I just wanted to honor them and mention that uh, while we are women in business, um, over 70% of the fee associated with this project will go to women and minority owned businesses that are part of our design team. Um, and that's a very high percentage um, and unusual. A number of those firms, uh, Sovereign, for instance, uh, are, are, are in Polio for very near to Polio. So we're, we're actually trying, very proud of how Western Mass based our design team is. Uh, the overall schedule, so as I said, it's a little hard to narrow it to give you specifics on how long this will take because there are a lot of decisions that get made along the way that affect schedule. But in the initial phase, I can tell you that um, we are, uh, Currently, this project has been committed to by the Mass School Building Authority and the city as a feasibility study, and that's what we're currently looking at. Um, so we're exploring options and locations and getting a sense of scale of the project, and then developing a preliminary set of designs that then the city will commit to with the state, and once that occurs, we go into more detailed designs. So this couple, Basically, most of this year will be spent on that feasibility study schematic design phase, and then the city will really make a final decision about moving forward on the project. Um, once they do, we'll spend a year doing all the detailed work on it to prepare for it to be bid and to go out um, for construction. So we've already gotten underway. Um, we're in this initial phase, and each of those markers we stop, we, we, we share a report, to the state and to the city, and then we move forward. Uh, so what is the project scope? Um, what we need to be exploring right now is whether or not this is two schools to serve 550 students each, or one school for 1,100 students. That question is posed partly because the state wants this community to know what the difference between those two situations looks like financially and physically. Um, they also want us at the same time to explore, well, just let's stop a second and point out that this is Lawrence School, this is the site of study, um, and I know that it's a school that has a lot of sentimental value to a lot of people who come into the school here. Um, but from a, the standpoint of a 21st century school, if you look around, you'll notice throughout Lawrence a lot of deficits. Um, so this is a school that they also want us to explore what would it look like to expand this, into a 550 student middle school, can it be done? What would be sacrificed in doing that? What would be the costs of doing that? And what would that look like? So we'll look at that. Um, but you can start to see some of the deficits of the school that could easily look like around the room. Um, and then we will also explore different sites and how, that, how, how these types of scenarios will look on different sites. And at this point, we're working with a committee, the school building committee, to explore what those options are and to get their input as sort of a, a guide for this, this the district, uh, and we're sharing uh, our thinking with them as we go forward. Uh, and then once we determine the sites, we establish the constraints uh, for the different sites. Maybe it requires buying a piece of land, maybe it requires uh, hazmat cleanup, 
we have to know what the costs of that are. At the same time, on a parallel track, we're trying to explore with the district what the educational goals of the project are, what that physically requires, how much space, how many classrooms, what kinds of spaces. Um, and then that program design really guides us as we move through the project. Uh, and then we explore the, the advantages and disadvantages and get some preliminary costs. And that's all we're doing at this, this phase of the work. We're not necessarily picking a direction. We want to present all of that and look at it objectively. Um, we're really interested in hearing from you uh, about your objectives for the project. We've heard from a lot of people that having a community group together is a rare opportunity for us. So I want to invite Joseph Kripczynski, who's our uh, civic engagement consultant on this project, to join me. Uh, and we want to just first find out a little bit about you and what draws you out tonight so that we can kind of uh, respond to some of your interesting questions. How is everyone? It's good to see some uh, familiar faces here tonight. And um, so we want to just start by kind of getting a sense of who's in the room. Right? So there, uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and it's uh, like back, back to school. Just raise your hand if, uh, if, you, if this is, uh, applies to you. So um, how many parents of Holyoke school children do we have in the room? Okay. How many students, current students, that are, that are going to the whole school system? Okay. Um, how many people in the room attended Holyoke Public Schools? Okay. Yeah. And uh, how many um, how many work or teach in the school? Okay. So we see how all these things kind of intersect and stuff. Um, how many are glad uh, to see the city thinking about uh, two new middle schools? Okay. And um, who lives in the Lawrence School District, this area that, that serves uh, the, the school, served by the school? Okay. Who lives in downtown, the full ward of downtown? Who lives there? And who lives uh, just in Holyoke in general? Anyone from outside Holyoke? Okay. Um, okay, so so one of the things that uh, that we want to do is just kind of understand, you know, to begin this, and as, as Gordon mentioned, this is very much about getting your feedback on this project and understanding, you know, what it is that, that you see as a need for a new middle school here. So I just want to actually throw it out as a question. If anyone wants to share with us what they think, uh, a, you know, a new middle school in Polio should be about, like some of the kind of key issues, some of the, you know, ideas or dreams or aspirations that you think for, for middle school. And uh, this is just kind of open-ended, you know, just kind of uh, anyone who wants to share something about what they think for middle school and polio should be about. So, uh, be loud, be loud. Current middle school teacher. 
teacher in Holyoke, and I've been a middle school teacher for 24 years, and have seen, um, you know, the, the Magnet Middle School, Lynch Middle School, Peck Middle School, and um, can speak to the need to have a middle school junior high model, just kind of developmentally speaking for the kids that we serve. Um, the the K-8 idea is nice, but it's just we have really done a disservice to the kids these past 10, 15 years. They're not ready to go to high school. Uh, the school that I'm at, the kids don't have lockers. We walk in lines. It's just not setting them up to be successful um, within the high school experience. So I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I also think that in terms of technology, the Lynch building is, is not going to be able, I think it would cost more money to make the Lynch building, uh, you know, Wi-Fi accessible and able to handle the demands that these kids need in terms of technology and science and engineering and all of that stuff. So I'm glad that we are having this conversation. Um, I think ideally, I, I would hope that there, if we're going to be talking about technology and developing an infrastructure to support it, that will be sustainable. That's my only concern, is that if we invest money in a new building, that 10, 20 years from now, that we'll be able to keep up with the, the technology as it changes, but also have it be a model for middle school kids, developmentally and socially. So I hope that we're thinking about the mind of the adolescent, because we really have been failing them in the K-8 model in these past 10 years. And I'll also share. There's going to be another opportunity at the end of the presentation for, for questions. And, uh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, in working with the school building committee, uh, we wanted to provide an opportunity for people to speak at those meetings, but also to, to comment to us privately. Um, and that, the same is true with you all, that I know not everyone's comfortable speaking in a group like this. So we actually asked our school building committee members to fill out a survey, some, somewhat open-ended, but a little bit directed, so that we could get their input. Um, and they shared their input, and one of the questions we asked, we asked, you know, about what they felt was lacking and what kinds of resources they'd like to see in a new school. But we also asked this sort of open-ended question that Joseph suggested, um, what do you imagine the headline being when this new school opens? Um, and we want positive headlines around Holyoke schools. And this is what they came up with, and it meant a lot to us to hear it because it captured the spirit uh, in some ways better than other things. So they said, Holyoke cultivated STEM growth in new middle school focused on technology. All Holyoke middle school students have access to world-class education facility. Holyoke's new middle school opens multiple learning pathways to its students. After 30 years, Holyoke opens state-of-the-art middle school. Or a couple other answers, but that kind of gave you the feeling for what the school building committee is working with us is thinking. Uh, I'd like to ask you all to share your thoughts as well. So on your on your table, there are cards that we ask you to fill out that will tell us who, what drew you here, what your connection is, who you are, um, and let's you register if you're interested in being more a part of this process so we can contact you again. And then it also encourages you to go to a link where you can actually fill out that survey. And we would really appreciate it because it's, it is really important for us to hear from you along the way. Um, so we understand that this is part of a larger process in many ways. It's connected to other things that are going on. Uh, and there's, uh, since we've been working with this city, we've been really impressed by how, um, how many committed and engaged educators we've met who are actively rethinking education. And that's been a really inspirational thing to us. And it will be a part of what we're doing to continue to connect with them throughout. Um, what we found at the building committee is after we gathered and sifted through their feedback and talked about things with them, these are some of the things that came out of their interest in this school, that, that set for us objectives that we hope to meet. You know, I think there's a big conceptual objective what does the school mean? What does it mean to be in the community? But also very specific ideas. So they, they also spoke about age-appropriate spaces, a need for um, STEM and STEAM, science, technology, uh, engineering, arts, and math curricula that's appropriate to middle schoolers with an emphasis on hands-on learning. I know that William uh, was once the pride of hands-on learning, and some of that's kind of gone away, and interestingly, the way these things work. 
there's a, a reinvigoration of the idea of hands-on learning and education. So that's come up a lot. Arts and music programs have been stressed as important. Providing diverse pathways. This is a consistent message from within the school building committee, but as well as throughout the district, that you have a variety of learners that have their own pathways. And with this day and age, and with technology, what it is, can we provide diverse pathways for students to go through school instead of a cookie cutter approach? Um, better IT infrastructure, which relates to that, is so that there's ways that students are now potentially learning uh, in, in multiple ways um, by use of technology along the way. And you're not going to be at the bleeding edge of that. A lot of things happen, and we've learned a lot about how technology is shaping the classroom, which is very helpful. Teacher collaboration spaces with so many different uh, types of students, teachers need to be able to meet and work together to assess students and their developmental needs and respond accordingly. So actually, we never really designed for that type of space in the 1950s, so thinking about creating spaces for collaboration is really important. Um, talking about varied space needs, again, rather than the 1950s model of all the same types of spaces, you enter, you go to your classroom, you're there all day, you leave. There's need now for students, particularly at this age range, to move from space to space, and for sometimes for you to meet with students in small groups. So we talk about different types of spaces and the need for different types of spaces, not a one-size-fits-all um, sort of down the hallway corridor kind of experience. Um, community connections and spaces comes up a lot. Um, so we understand the importance of this facility, not just as a place of education, but also as a place of community and how it relates to the, the, the community. And this is really where you can play a big role in helping us to understand that a little bit more. Um, what does it mean to be a school in the 21st century in terms of your relationship to community? Is it, is it just about having gym access at night for basketball? Or could that school actually play a more active role in providing uh, evening education opportunities, opportunities for parents uh, to pursue learning of their own, uh, year-round learning, um, support services, uh, community health services. Those are some of the questions that we've been asking. Um, sense of safety for students, that comes up a lot. It comes up a lot for us always on every project, but, uh, but it also is something we're hearing from people in Polio. How do we make this an environment that uh, makes students feel safe? Because students learn better when they feel that they are safe. Um, and that's something you have to design for. It doesn't just then we'll get to some issues that are really also specifically about environmental quality, the importance of daylighting and views has come up uh, as a priority for the district. Um, Non-toxic uh, materials and good air quality. Um, you find, in looking back at time, different generations of schools have different toxicity problems based on what the products that were going in the school at the time were. Uh, and then after hours use and year-round use. So that gives you a sense of some of the priorities that we're hearing, uh, and I hope that they mirror some of your priorities. Uh, and when we get to questions and answers, I hope you can uh, share other ideas that you don't see addressed. I'm going to introduce Margot Jones. She's going to talk a little bit about the specific and programming process. Okay, thanks, Lori, very much. Uh, I'll move through this quickly. I think the uh, PowerPoint's going to be available online so you can look at the details. Uh, later, but basically, during this study phase, we take modern educational uh, philosophy and apply it to the middle school. So you can see on the left, that's the way schools used to be designed. It was cells and bells. It was one classroom with kids lined up in a row and the expert teacher at the front. Well, it turns out that uh, lecture-type learning is very effective, and that in fact, where we're going in the 21st century is making student-based learning, where they uh, have hands-on opportunities to study the concepts of science and technology, and they make things, and by making things, they really understand the concepts that they're trying to learn. So. Um, the 21st century skills that will serve these children well as citizens and um, productive members of society are critical thinking, communication, collaboration, uh, creativity, and curiosity for lifelong learning. And that those are skills that will make them good citizens and help them uh, find their way through the world. Um, so the concept is brain-based learning, and that is sort of what is fundamental to how
how we will design a school. It includes, uh, as I said, hands-on learning and also movement. The kids that are stationary, are, their brain sort of goes to sleep. You need to really move around and use your whole body to learn. So, uh, which, and, and you also need to feel safe in the learning environment at all times. Um, emotional engagement is very, very important, especially for middle school students who tend to sort of start to group think and uh, are very peer oriented and worried and um, distracted quite a bit, unfortunately. It's just a, anyway, um, so, so we've got to really keep them engaged and provide an, an environment that's going to function very well. And that does include daylight and uh, healthy air, etc. Thermal comfort, all those things that sometimes you're not getting currently. Uh, we also have found that uh, if you have a connection to nature in school, it, it grounds you and gives your mind a place to go to and that actually stimulates learning as well. So some of the concepts are that uh, we want to use every square inch of this new school because learning can happen anywhere and we want it to happen everywhere in the school. So as you can see in that picture, <laughs> they're under the stairs and they're reading their books or talking to their friends and learning things. Um, learning in school is now uh, 24, well not quite 24 seven, but uh, all day and all year process and all those other things. It's very important that classrooms are inclusive for all kinds of learners and, and types of children um, and that they're supported by current technology. So again, um, part of the brain-based approach to learning and teaching is that you explore ideas on multiple modalities, uh, you can research and design your your learning program, you actually make things, um, and then it's important to present those ideas and celebrate what you're learning, which is part of the social engagement as well, which is very, very critical at this stage. So here are some spaces in schools that uh, we like, and some of them we've designed, and some of them Laura Wernick from HMFH has designed, uh, our Cambridge Educational Planner. Um, here is what's called a, a, it's a common space that's around uh, two levels, so they share some, some tables and tech space there. Um, this is Plain School, where we did clustered classrooms with a little common space and common areas with different types of furniture in the classrooms. And we'll get to this cluster design again. Uh, we like to provide little opportunities for small group learning and reading and age-appropriate spaces. Again, we've heard over and over again that you need uh, a, the right size furniture and places for middle school kids. We also know that the school becomes a community center, and uh, MSBA is pretty generous with those kind of spaces, and we will design them so they're very multifunctional and very usable. Um, one on the left, this is Plain School, the calf, but we're, the picture's taken from the stage. This is the cafeteria, and it opens onto the, to the gymnasium. This is a school in the Boston area where the community, it's, it's almost like a mall. It's a celebrated space where people get to look at each other and it's very active. So we hope to do that as well. Um, and again, different size and types of spaces for learning. Uh, and then I'll just ju jump into a diagram that we're thinking about for the kinds of spaces that MSBA uh, has guided us to develop for the school. Basically, on the first floor, on the ground floor, uh, there'd be a very secure main entrance uh, that would be overseen by the administration, and close to it, as you came in, um, would be family services, medical, and guidance. And then there'd be this common area. And this diagram, by the way, is not totally graphically to scale. It's just a concept at this point. 
the common space would have a cafeteria open to it. It would have a tech lab and an art lab open to it, and then a stage with a band room, and maybe this could serve as one of the big space uh, and food service and a service entrance off to one side. And again, that access to the gymnasium, which will be available at night and off hours. Uh, and we want to have an outdoor space at, that, at this level as well. There would be some inclusive sped uh, rooms that are near the health center and the front door so that um, folks with limited mobility would be able to get right to their learning environment. But then the three grades, six, seven, and eight, would be, uh, are, would be organized into two different clusters. This is 180 kids per grade, roughly, for the 550 school. And each cluster would be 90 pupil grouping. And shared between those uh, teams, essentially, would be part of the media center, some specialized educational uh, spaces, a project space, and other small group um, offices and things such for guidance and an assistant principal. So we're going to be developing this design, but these are some concepts that quickly um, that we can show you. These clusters would have uh, four academic classrooms around a common space, which we're calling a project area, with, with a specialized science lab as well, with prep room, and then two small group learning areas. So these teachers could share this one, and these, uh, this, this also, there's a classroom for either English as a second language or a specialized a special ed classroom. Um, and we're also hoping to get access to an outdoor area for each team. So these clusters are just different ways of organizing these spaces and we'll be working with the teachers and the school building committee to figure out which is most functional for them. But this one is a little more, uh, you know, uh, standardized. This arrow indicates the way to the shared common space on that grade level. So that each grade level will have two clusters, probably the same design. Here are some other ideas for project, uh, for clusters. And sometimes the circulation goes right through this grouping of, of a team area, and sometimes it's on the edge. So we, we have to figure this out. That's the fun part, really. So another uh, sort of concept that we're working from is that, the, as I said, the ground floor is the public part of the community of the school. But there would be barriers along the way to make sure that the, anyone who comes into the school is wanted and that it's safe. So it would be a natural buffer, it would be some kind of plaza, all that core public space, and then the grades uh, would be separated off for even greater safety. So, and now Christian's going to talk about site changes. Thank you. So, um, in another few months, I hope to be up here and uh, presenting some actual designs, which would be more fun to go through. But we want to quickly go through some of the uh, existing sites and the uh, and some of the existing. Uh, constraints and opportunities that we're exploring. So these are all the schools within the district. Um, the, the Statement of Interest, um, which was the official document that went to the Massachusetts School Building Authority, um, was for the, the Lawrence School. Um, and so that's the, the kind of focus. That's why we're meeting here tonight, and it's the focus of the study. Um, as the district mentioned that they wanted to um, look at two 550 school, 550 student middle schools. Um, the Peck School um, obviously was, was another um, prime site. Um, so we, we, we focused on those two at the very beginning. Um, again, we've only been at, at this for about a month and a half. Um, but from there, we wanted to, to look a, a bit broader um, around the city. Um, and um, so we, look, we looked at the other schools, both the, the physical condition of those schools and the site, and how receptive that site is to a possible um, middle school, 550 student size 
building and, and all that it requires. Um, the McMahon Elementary School seemed like a possible candidate. Um, it has a nice open site. Um, it, the school's in, you know, on the lower end of the spectrum in terms of the physical shape of the building. Um, but unfortunately, the land all around that building is, is protected parkland. Um, so it does not look very promising for, for uh, a new site. Um, during that discussion, there's also this site off of Whiting Farms Road. Um, so this is the Kmart closet down here, and there's a fire station right there, a small white dot. Um, and Whiting Farms Road curls around like this. So um, there's a potential of using this site up here. It's a little bit um, steep, especially on the east side of it. Um, but there is some access from the south. Um, so these are some of the sites that we're, we're starting to explore. For the Lawrence site, uh, here we are in the cafeteria right here. Um, so we're exploring both the Lawrence site and um, the site across the street, the Chestnut Street site, as we're calling it. Um, we certainly are looking at a, an addition renovation option for the Lawrence School. Um, as, as Dory mentioned, the, the, the MSBA, the Massachusetts School Building Authority, requires us to look at an 1100 student school. They're also re requiring us to look at an ad reno school. Um, and certainly that is something that we're interested in. I think that you know, it'll come down to an issue of cost and also how flexible this existing school is for um, some of the concepts that Margo went through on, on a new 21st century uh, middle school and, and seeing how closely those can align. Um, certainly, building new on the, uh, on the Chestnut Street site um, is enticing. It's pretty rare to find an open block in an urban downtown environment like this, um, and, and one that that really has has a lot of um, really beautiful and interesting bones around it. So when we look at that site, um, the Chestnut Street site in particular, um, one of the main things that hit us right away was was the, the interaction between um, what we hope will be the new front door and the existing um, park outside of the library there. Um, that really the park is framed very nicely um, and, and um, a new development to the corner of that um, could work very well with, with, with what's going on in Holyoke already. Walking down um, Cabot Street and Hampshire Street, you don't notice the grades so much. Those are pretty gentle grades, but really going from this corner of, of Elm and Hampshire down to this corner of Cabot and Chestnut. It's about a 20 foot change in, in elevation. Um, so there are some pretty significant grades on this site, which um, present some constraints in terms of which floor level will have to be where, but it also provides some opportunities of really helping this block feel a little bit like a campus and, and having some separation between that school block and the, and the surrounding um, streets. Um, and kind of like that diagram that Margot showed earlier, giving some natural separation between um, this public urban environment and, and a little bit more of a private, secure uh, school environment. Um, certainly the, the, the size of the buildings around the neighborhood, um, a, a new three to four story school would fit in well. Um, and then another thing to note is just that the, the grid, the urban grid is, is offset from the cardinal directions about 45 degrees. So when we start thinking about natural daylighting and, and bringing in controllable southern and northern light into the school, um, we'll have to, uh, to wrestle with, with the difference between the, the cardinal directions and the, and the urban street grid. The Peck site, which is another one that we studied from the very beginning, um, fairly close to, uh, to the Lawrence site, but a little bit convoluted and getting from one to the other. Um, tucked back in a residential neighborhood um, with the dingle to the north of it. Um, there's this really unique relationship between the Peck School and the existing high school. Um, something that really, I think, could be celebrated and, and, and done um, better than it is now. Um, so that's something that struck us right away. First, we, we were looking at because one of, the, one of the things we'll have to consider is where the students will go while construction is happening, so we're thinking about all of those spacing issues. So one thing that we wanted to explore was keeping the Peck School um, functioning while we built a new school to the north of it. 
Um, but after spending some time really evaluating the jingle and spending some time there, um, it, it looks very difficult, if not impossible. There's a lot of noise concerns for Beach Street. Um, all this area shaded in gray here is, is quite steep and sloping to the north, so not so good for solar access for the new school. And then this dashed green line is showing a, a path that's needed to access the, uh, the electrical substation that's up here at the top of that, um, up at that corner. But certainly a new formalized um, connection between the high school and that site really could um, become a nice amenity to that site. Similarly, a better connection between the school and Crozier Field. Um, it's another great opportunity right next to that school site. Um, we're, our initial thoughts is to pull the building back a little bit from this residential neighborhood. It is an interesting site in that it feels like it's kind of the backyard of all of these small houses um, and not, not really on the public side of Beach Street like the high school is. So we're giving it a little bit more room and breathing space, um, especially to the south and the east where you can get some nice solar access. Um, it would be nice. Given the grades that are in that area, it would be a tiered building. Um, but the challenge, and I think one that um, could work out quite nicely, is, is how to make that tiered building join together so it's not in separate pods like the existing school is. And then bringing the parking a little bit closer to, uh, a little bit closer to the site. So as I mentioned, another this was uh, another site that really just came uh, up uh, two days ago. Um, so we haven't had that much time to, to study all the ins and outs. But um, this parcel right here, outlining there, um, is another potential site. Again, on the east side, it is quite steep, um, but it, but it is accessible from the south. Um, this is I-91, and this is the Kmart um, shopping center. Um, so one thing that we'll be evaluating as we go forward with our consultants and with the building committee is um, costs and costs, project costs in general, and then project costs that are specific to the city of Holyoke. Um, site costs um, can become very important in that process. Um, so we'll be evaluating both PEC and um, Widen Farms in terms of location and also in terms of costs and, uh, and, and um, just how well those sites can serve a new, a new middle school. So as uh, George mentioned, we're very early in the process. We're um, here in February. Um, this orange so block is uh, us evaluating existing conditions, getting several different options on the table and submitting those to the state. Um, then we start moving forward into a, a preferred design, so we start narrowing in on, on what the, the city um, and what you all would like to do for a preferred schematic. Um, and if that gets approved by the state, then we start moving forward into schematic design where we really start getting into the, the details a little bit um, and have a much better idea of um, construction costs. Um, and so that's what happens by the I think this has been extended actually a little bit from the from where the state um, deadlines have fallen. So it gets extended to the end of December, and then we start talking about dollars and cents, and um, and if we move forward into the more detailed um, design development and construction documents. So we want to open it back up and see if you have any questions or comments, thoughts on the sites, or thoughts on the um, programming that Margaret went through, or, or the process, anything that we can answer. I'm wondering if there have been any studies done on the um, um, you know, small urban setting of the advantages and disadvantages of a school, of middle school kids, a thousand versus yeah, I don't know of any literature that talks specifically at that size or that scale. That the problem is that there's so many variables that to find literature that cuts across a you know a, a double-blind analysis of one size school versus another. We've certainly heard from the building committee and from the district that there's not much of a appetite for an 1100 student school. Um, it seems like an awful lot of kids, particularly of that age group, together. 
Um, there's also, you know, the factors of the geographic diversity in Holyoke and busing costs and, and things of that nature to consider. Um, but that's something that we'll evaluate, so not only the construction cost impact, but also the, um, the operating cost impact. Um, but I think that the, from the state side, so they're, you know, it's, it's a grant agency and, and they have the, the hoops that we need to jump through. Um, they just want to make sure that we're exploring all of our options. I don't think that they're determined that it be one size or another. They just want to make sure that we're really looking at all the options along the way. Lynch site been considered at all? Uh, we did look at that. It's fairly constrained in its size and its location. Um, and so because of those factors, um, it was not given as in-depth of a consideration as, as McMahon was, but um, that is our... But the STD study we did look at, and what we were told is that uh, just to get Lynch back up to uh, code would require a huge investment was not worth uh, investing in the lynch site. So we, prior to engaging in this MSBA process, they, the state, the uh, building authority allowed us to do a uh, assessment of our school, all our schools, and we included lynch in that. And um, it scored the lowest predictably because it hasn't been a school in a while. But also we were told it's not worth um, the investment to bring it back given how much disrepair is there and then to bring it up to code would require tremendous investment. So we did look at it. But, but I have questions about that because, and, and no offense, I apologize because sure. I was late, but that did used to be a middle school. It's a mid-century modern, it's a beautiful piece of architecture. It's been sitting vacant forever. We already own it. You're talking about multi-levels anyway. If you went up, wouldn't you have enough square footage? And we've been told many times in the city of Holyoke that buildings are not fixable and then turned around and a private company comes in like Hoyo Catholic. We have um, a spectacular race street. They just did beautiful condos and apartments down there. I, I would really like to see numbers for that. It, we don't even know what it's going to cost to build new schools, but we don't know what it's going to cost to fix Lynch. And unless there's a formal report somewhere, I personally think that Lynch would be a great location. It has sidewalks. Um, I don't mind Lawrence. Peck is going to be very tricky with the dingle. I don't think you can ever do anything with that dingle. I don't know. Um, but I really don't want to say, oh, can't do lunch unless I get to see some numbers. Yeah, and so there has been a published report that um, Dr. Zwerk mentioned. So uh, the I'm a little bit outside of knowledge base, but I think the MSBA helped the district hire an outside architecture firm, STB, um, who came through and, and evaluated all of the different buildings um, and, and gave each one a score. And that's where a lot of that building side of it, in terms of the cost to upgrade uh, the, the Lynch building. Um, there are some slight questions as well, but certainly that's something that we can, we can take a look at and put it back on the table. What I can tell you, Ben, is that the Lynch is about half the size of the proposed school to meet the needs of 550 kids. So the size of the basic structure is, is half of what we would need to pursue our basic plans. But how many square feet are there now? About 50,000 square feet. In and, and how many square feet are we talking for about 500 kids? I think was what they were at. How many? I'm sorry? About 110,000. For 550 kids? That's correct. That's the initial analysis. I, how much does Holyoke Community have, for God's sake? I mean, this is a lot of square feet. Uh, it's fitting the state model for what they feel is necessary for the educational needs of the current time and what they will reimburse the community for. Okay. So I think it's great that we're doing this. I think it's about time. And I think our students deserve a brand new state of the art building. I think some of our buildings, as it shows me, I'm a lover of Lynch. Um, but I think our kids, it's time. It's really, really time that we give them state of the art. Let's really start supporting them so they can do great things. Um, 
but current status, we don't have the technology, we don't have the building space. So I, I, I love this, I think it's great. And I think what you guys are doing is great. But I'm gonna make a couple of little negatives. So I watched the slideshow and I saw the pictures. A couple things that concern me, um, just so you know, I'm the head of the SPED pack, so I tend to automatically gravitate towards the special ed students in the district. When I looked at the pictures and the, the break areas and things like that, I didn't see any sensory equipment, any you know beanbag chairs, um, or anything sensory in any of those pictures, yeah. which was concerning. Um, I didn't see that it was really handicap accessible, to be honest, in those pictures. Um, and another concern is there was that great picture of the school in Boston with a huge staircase. You know, we need to be mindful that some of our students are in wheelchairs, and they shouldn't be segregated by having to use an elevator. You know, this school needs to be in the process of thinking. We need to think of ramps so that they can be with their peers and their peer partners um, walking and navigating the school. So when you guys are doing your planning and thinking, I want you to really keep in mind that we have a high population of special ed students in this district, and they need to start being in the forefront of all planning in this district. So I need to see more of that kind of stuff. Um, when I'm looking at your planning and I'm hearing your designs, I think it's all great, but I want to know how you're integrating our special ed students. And I, I personally wasn't a fan of seeing bubbles of sped rooms. Um, we're we working towards having a more integrated district, yep. if I'm not mistaken, and making sure that our special ed students are integrated more into the classrooms. So seeing um, specifically, some specifically designated areas is kind of concerning. I want to see more fluid. I want to see more access. And that was concerning in your diet. So. Let me try and respond to some of those things. Okay. We've actually, uh, we've been hearing you completely, we've actually uh, been doing an assessment. And when you start this process, the state gives you this sort of uh, assumption about uh, spaces. Uh, and spaces for special education students are uh, under the guidelines of DESC. So we do have to account for where these students are. And that, um, but we've already learned a lot about the requirements uh, for the population in polio. Um, and as a result, uh, the, the amount of space available in the school will seem to be significantly higher than what the state assumed, and that will not be a problem for us to get that extra space. We do have to show it as to where it is, but we do understand the inclusion model. Um, so the, I think, in fact, in fact, I think it's helpful to kind of go back to the diagram a little bit. There are um, there are some students in the Shine program who will be in a particular space. So that first cluster that you see at the bottom, yeah. that actually is specifically for uh, those designated classrooms, whereas the intent in the other uh, areas that we're showing is to show those um, support spaces that would be throughout the school intentionally. So we do have to account for where they are, but we're intentionally trying to be sure that they're integrated so it's both there as well as within the cluster where you have an additional classroom space. And some of it's a little bit about being sure that you provide that flexibility, because we want to have the ability for students to be um, in a, a special education class for a while and then also be integrated. So that kind of pull out push in process of happening in Holyoke is supported by having those spaces throughout the school. Um, and so that then we have the flexibility to kind of change that program over time. Whereas if you put it all on one floor or one area, that doesn't work. So we intentionally have tried to describe it this way, and we do have to show it because we have to report to DESC, and they have to actually sign off on that plan. Um, but we intentionally have tried to kind of integrate it. And I think if you go to the cluster diagrams, part of these small group spaces is that they may come from some of that allocation of space um, because what they'll often be doing is supporting the need to do a uh, pull out of a general classroom uh, to do, say, uh, guided, uh, reading support or particular support with students who are in an integrated classroom um, but need uh, additional support but as close to the classroom as possible and then go back in and then that space actually ends up being useful also for other reasons why you might pull you know, students out so it can just be a small group room so they're, they're, it's become a more complicated way of working that out throughout the school and I think your comment about 
mobility is really good. This is unfortunately not going to be a single floor building. There will be an elevator, but there. But I think it's a great comment to think about um, right. ramping, particularly on that main level. Yeah. Um, you know where we might have the school at a level that then requires kind of access in and then access throughout, so that there's a sense of commonality. But as a um, likely for story building, we probably wouldn't be able to ramp the, 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 the entire process. We'll probably have to do a mixture. But um, because of the requirements needed in space for ramping. But thank you, those are good comments. Can I, can I also just suggest a line that I think it's important. I, I, I'd be interested in looking at the Henderson School in Boston. That is the, I think they built a high school, which is an inclusion school um, that uh, I think they just had a new addition put, put on. I'd be interested in, it'd be good even if members of this, uh, our special ed parent advisor would go and see um, different schools that have been specifically built to support an inclusion environment, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think of the Henderson just, I mean, Mar Margaret, do you know if the Henderson, did, did they just do an addition to that school? Um, they, I know they have an elevator. Okay. Um, I'm not sure they've actually made an addition. Okay. So, hi everybody, I'm Margaret Wood. I'm, I'm the sorry. project manager for the project. I'm sort of staying in the background, but I have been working with Boston Public Schools on their 10-year facility master plan, which is why Steve is asking the question. The Henderson is two campus school in Boston that has a K-12 program, and they do... It's a full inclusion school. Full inclusion program. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so we have to do elevators. Can we, like, make them big enough that yeah. it could be regular ed and special ed students right. can use the elevator. You know what I mean? Like, so that way it, it's just more integrated. Personally, I would love to see you come in so that you can really have the integration to be what it's supposed to be. But it's helpful to also just have the comments brought up because you also want to be sure that you're not thinking about well, how do you put the word let's put the elevator back in the service if it's, if it's heavily used. You want it to be very useful and accessible. It's also like when you're thinking for stuff like this, it's easy to be mindful of the typical. You know, that typical integrated um, some of our special needs students, like some of that, some of those pictures, as fabulous as they are, um, they just don't work. Well, we also heard, and, and I think we found Margo would, would probably echo this, that whenever we work uh, with the community, it's so special education teachers, they're kind of at the forefront of thinking about the environment. Um, so, and then often they're the ones who, who educate the rest of the staff about the, the importance of flexible furnishings and furnishings that move and like you're talking about feedback chairs and different things that serve tall tables um, and then sensory issues, sounds, um, carpeting, uh, all those issues might come important not just to that community but to the entire school because they're in the school together. So, thank you. One question I have is how does this impact the current elementary school so I'm not sure how many years ago it was 12 years ago when we decided to change all the elementary schools to K-8 and I think it was around then mm -hmm. and we went to expense to do that when we did that we eliminated a lot of art rooms we eliminated the music room we eliminated the computer room and so now we have art on a cart um, we have very limited music in some of our schools if we do have new middle schools, will that bring those other subjects as dedicated rooms back to our elementary school students? Or, and, and also the special ed kids, they're, they're squashed into little rooms in some of these elementary schools that, you know, they're shared by three teachers. So will that open, how many students from each school will be leaving and will that leave space to accommodate bringing back some of the things that we lost. We can't answer all that and Dr. Jack will have to respond to some of it, but uh, certainly what we're hearing is that the advantage of creating a middle school is that right now you have teachers dealing with that wide age range, often in an environment that wasn't, you know, so a teacher who's teaching um, art in K-8 might be doing two schools and across a wide age range. By, by creating a concentration of middle school students, you're able to provide, uh, your teachers are not having to span as wide a age range, and therefore will be able to provide uh, more efficient services, and therefore also probably have less turnover, I'm hoping. Um, 
And, and then also you will free up space within the, school, the, 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 the schools that were K-6 that became K-8, you know, and we'll have more age-appropriate space for the middle school students. So I, I know that we've been doing that for the middle school side a little bit more because we're not um, studying, uh, but the district is aware and thinking about how that then affects population numbers and changes the nature of it. But I think the drive that we're hearing is very strongly coming from a sense that that did not work out well. Essentially, what could you achieve by changing this back? So, Dr. Wang, do you think yeah. you can respond? Yeah. Um, so the answer to your question is yes. Uh, it would help alleviate some of the uh, art on the card and uh, cramped spaces that are, uh, you know, we forced kids into spaces that weren't appropriate because our buildings weren't set up to, uh, and we're pretty crowded in the elementary school, uh, uh, in the elementary school or K eight schools now. The one thing we did an analysis last year, if we move the whole system to a middle school, elementary middle school model, we would save $5 million in today's dollars. That's without the efficiencies of a new school. We would have to take schools offline that are just bad buildings. And we have schools running on electrical key, right, that are just bad, inefficient buildings. So this would presume we close some schools, bring some new facilities, uh, but there would be overall savings that you could, you could better invest into programming. Um, it also allows us to tailor the programming for the age group. You know, some of these schools have one music teacher teaching K to eight, but what middle school kids need for music is different than, you know, elementary students, students need. Same with art. Uh, I, you know, we're not tailoring. And sometimes in middle school, you may want different programming for specialist periods than you would in elementary. Not, you know, uh, we have a sort of, a, we have a one size fits all model. Right now, we, we're very inefficient and then we have a lot of space at the high school and middle school level. Well, Packett and Dean have a lot of space. Everywhere else in the system is jammed. Like our space is really tight at all, Metcalf, all the elementary schools. Uh, and so we, we need to right size the district there as well. But in moving to a middle school model, we'll be able to save uh, resources that we should be able to put back into schools to provide some of the programming that, that you asked about. I, I would I would really like some kind of assurance that we could go back to having art rooms, music rooms, computer rooms. I'm, I'm forgetting one thing. Yep. Well, we're already moving the system back. To, we're slowly, even before these, well, if these buildings are built, we are already, we don't know for sure, but we are moving the system already back to a K-5 uh, or elementary, middle school, high school model starting next year. We've already announced about a STEM school. Uh, and Dean, um, and we want to continue to make that move, which will allow for the spaces in some of these schools to be used. Like Ian White next year will get back its spaces, some of its spaces. Um, but you're absolutely right; it, it, it really created a, a crunch in those schools. Uh, even though I would argue that there are music spaces that aren't great spaces because those facilities, many of those, many of those schools are just old bad facilities, but it's better to have a space than have no space at all. Right, I mean, most of the kids are up on the stage or no, no, things are corded off. You've got McMahon, you've got kids on the stage for uh, music. I know Ian White's had to do that at different times. Uh, you've got art on a card. I don't know, Morgan. You know, we, have, we don't have music. Yeah, that, Morgan doesn't have music right now. So, yeah, it's uh, no question that, that, that that's part of the intention of the I, I think that the, the middle school debate has been going on for a long time here, but I think it's important, as anybody who knows me, my recurring theme is keeping kids who live in Holyoke in Holyoke Public Schools. And right now, I'm still not seeing, with the exception of Ian, um, a lot of people, I have seen actually a couple more, people who live in Ward 7, I was talking with a couple people today, Chinese Immersion School, Hatfield, South Hadley, still. So uh, this will help. A middle school system will help. I think locations for those are extremely important. Yep. Yep. I think Kmart is like a death wish. No kid could ever ride their bike anywhere over there. The traffic there is awful right now. Um, Lawrence with his two sites, but I thought that lot was contaminated. Did anybody? I mean, I was told years ago that they couldn't build anything there because it was contaminated. Heck, obviously, is right in the middle. That's a good choice. But 
you know, for people like me who don't have a kid in the system anymore, it's always like the balls are in the air and we kind of want them to come down and see something actually happen. That's well, I think that's the intention here. I also just remind you, the majority of the kids that go to volleyball schools live downtown. And that there, I, I feel very strongly that there needs to be a school that services this I agree downtown. With you. To your point about attracting other families, it's not just about middle school versus elementary. The quality has to improve too, right? So the quality of the experience has to improve. I do know there are many families that I, I have asked for middle school. They want the separation mm -hmm. for sure, and I hear that. Uh, but it, it's that plus improving quality and programming for for families. The dual language program is something that's attracted a lot of kids. We want to continue to offer those experiences to more families. But I do want to point out that the majority of the families in our system do live down here and to have a state-of-the-art school right in the center of the city is important for many of the families that, um, you know, I have to say the, the buildings we have in and around downtown leave a lot to be desired for kids. You know, I, I have to be honest, I was shocked when I came here for the first time and saw the condition of these buildings. And it's not because our custodians don't work hard oh, and take know. care of the schools. It's just we've let them over a long period of time, you know, fall into, I mean, they're, they're old. And the city, the kid, whoever said that before, uh, and Ms. Burks, our kids deserve better than this. I agree. Um, when we talk about schools, we talk about the
And there was a time when the library was the center of the school. Mm -hmm. The only library that's functioning now is at Hoya Creek School. Mm -hmm. And there's no funding. That's one of the quickest places that funding gets. Mm -hmm. My concern about Lynch and about what can be done with this is time frame in terms of all these plans and everything and funding will take years to take uh, to come into fruition and i just really believe that our students need the middle schools now and we should try to fix what we have so that we can have active functioning middle schools as soon as possible one of the unfortunate problems with lynch as an immediate solution uh, I think the district is working at, a, at an immediate mechanism for reallocating in, uh, middle school students, regardless of whether this project is completed by a certain date or not. But Lynch would not be able to fall into that because partly because it's got an abating issue, significant quality. So to abate the school and address its accessibility would put you in the same time frame as what we're talking about, unfortunately. So that's a real problem with Lynch as a solution. Um, yes, sir. Um, so I was going to say, I, I agree with Dr. Zwick that I think that our downtown students are the ones who really need to have um, a, a building like this. So my question would be, if it were to be in Whiting Farm Road, for example, is the school going to be zoned the same way that schools are normally? Are students going to be able to have school choice? Um, because I know that a brand new you know, middle school coming in, everyone's going to want to send their child there. So I kind of wanted to know what your thoughts on that are. Um, on our that and if that was something that you guys are taking in um, consideration while looking for a new location. So I mean we're so that's why we're talking about two middle schools where <laughs> every child in the city could have access to one of the new facilities. So we don't have to have that conversation. Who's getting a new school? Uh, there's a need for you know, 1,100 seats minimum and the, these two buildings would allow for that. Um, so ideally you'd have one school down here and then one school that was more central like in PAC or that's why we're looking at a second site. Um, and that's my hope, that's been my hope all along, the proposal all along, is that we would get two sites. Now, who would go for, you know, what's program? We have, we have these groups of kids coming up in programs. Uh, the, for instance, we have the dual language program, Metcalf's gonna run out of room, right? We also have the um, a P3 program at PEC that's a te very technology-focused program. The facility at PEC doesn't lend itself to that kind of learning for kids. So, you know, we're, which programs go first, you know, first is going to be, that, those are internal conversations we're having now. But ideally, every child in the city would have the option of going to a brand new middle school. Um, and hopefully, those two buildings will be built and they'll be built kind of around the same time. Um, and then we'd be able to take off some schools offline so as a system we would be able to save money and put the resources back into the school. So that's the current um, thinking with the priority being the downtown school and then the second school would be more of a cent you know more um, central oh, you know uh, the PEC site that's why we look to them to tell us where we go or not go so, does that answer your question yeah, yeah. yes um, in, in your feasibility studies I'm, I'm thinking about the technology so when um, Holyoke started kind of upgrading its internet system and we got these wonderful laptops prior to the Chromebooks. Where Morton School is, there's nothing but apartment buildings around it. So every time you tried to access the wireless um, network, it would go to the apartment buildings it, that didn't know where the access points were. So they had to do some kind of configuration so that everybody, all the laptops, knew to go to the router in the building. So when you're talking about these issues and, and sites, can we please make sure that that kind of stuff, because I, this is what I do every day. So it's, it's wonderful, but you know, if we have technology in these kind of crumbling schools, but if I'm trying to have the kids log in, and it's trying to access the Wi-Fi from across the street, then what's the point? So is that part of the conversation too? We'll write that down now, and we'll see you in a year and a half to make sure to hear that again. <laughs> so, yeah, it is little issues like that that become big issues once construction starts. But yeah, just so everybody understands, so we're, you know, we go through a long process of designing the building. There's also a separate, we 
get a contract with a contractor who builds that building. There's also a separate kind of pot of money and a separate process for both furniture and technology. And so that gets included in the school and happens as a, at a later um, point in the process because you want to get the very latest furniture and particularly the very latest technology so that you don't need the, quite the lead time that you do to build the whole building. But yeah, that, all, that will all get wrapped into the process. And that's one of the advantages of building it, because we certainly have been in a position of trying to address an old school, and you can get that infrastructure in there to support that need, but it's, it's significantly more challenging when you're masonry walls and plaster walls, and you're trying to get that same uh, distribution of Wi-Fi, particularly. Uh, so that I can understand. Most districts are trying to retrofit, and that's very different result than if you're starting from scratch where you're coordinating the end results with the infrastructure at the same time that you're building. And I, and I know that people are, are very fond of this idea of Lynch, but the thought of being a classroom teacher, having to go from one old school into another old school and try to have to navigate, and I'm just, you know, when this lady was talking about elevators, I worked at Peck for 14 years, and there was one elevator in that building for kids that had wheelchairs. And it just, it, the buildings, we've outgrown these buildings in Holyoke. I'm in them every day. But it's not, there's no going back. We need to go forward. That seems like a good place to, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, are there uh, hurdles in terms of acquiring properties? Because uh, the, the tax site is the only one that is fully owned by the city. Am I right? Or is, is, oh, the, is, there, is this lot across the street, you know, also owned by the city? The White Farms is a private property, I mean, I mean, No, it's the Holyoke Development Authority, so it's oh, okay. quasi-public. That's okay. why it's okay. being kind of explored as a possibility, because it's, it's a lot closer to being accessible. Mm -hmm. All of those, well, our job is really, you know, we don't, necessarily go out and, and purchase property, we just try and look at what are all the cost implications, right. what are all the constraints. Um, so acquisition, I mean the, the lot across the street, um, part of that is owned by the diocese, so that's a constraint that we have to acknowledge and we have to understand. Um, soils is a constraint we have to understand on that. So we try and put all those constraints out and help the school building uh, committee assess those constraints and costs and come to the right conclusion. It's not necessarily the, 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 the you want to get the right school um, given all those constraints. Um, so all of those issues have to be uh, addressed along the way. Great. Thank you very much for, for coming. I would again just point out this uh, piece of paper on the table. If you could be so kind as to tell us who you are, um, let us know if you're interested in being involved in this process of informed that we appreciate it. And also again there's a survey that you can go through and Thank you very much.